Hello, everyone, and welcome to MLS Live. Today, we are talking with Museum of Science educators about unusual colors in nature. My name is Sarah. My pronouns are she and her, and I'll be keeping an eye out for all of your questions today. Uh, thank you for those of you who are tuning in on Facebook, but please note that we're not able to share your comments with our educators. If you are here on Zoom, you can press the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you'd like a shout out, if we end up asking your question, feel free to leave your name and age. If you'd like to see captions, you can click on the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen and select show captions. So now I would like to invite my first museum educator and animal friend to introduce themselves and we'll get started. Hi everyone, I'm Liz, Assistant Curator from the Live Animal Center, and helping me out today will be Megan, a museum educator, special guest star with us today. And we're going to be talking about unusual colors in nature. So the animals you're going to be meet may be animals you're familiar with seeing before, um, but they're in colors that are slightly different than what you'd normally see in the wild. So I'm gonna have Megan turn on our animal camera and we'll meet our first animal. All right, so you guys were probably able to tell pretty quickly that this is a snake. More specifically, this is a red rat snake, more commonly called a corn snake. Red rat snake is more the proper name for the snake, but they are very commonly called corn snakes. Now they get that name corn snake and many of the kinds you find in the wild, uh, they actually have a pattern on the underside of their belly that kind of looks like maize or Indian corn. Uh, this one doesn't really have it, um, but that is why they are named corn snakes. Uh, they also tend to hang out in cornfields, so sometimes people think that may have had something to do with the name as well. Now, corn snakes are native to the United States. You can pretty much find them in a lot of eastern and some central parts of the U.S. You won't find them as far north as Massachusetts. Pretty much New Jersey is as far north as they get. So they are not native to this area, but they are U.S. residents. Now they're pretty decent sized snakes. This one's probably pretty close to full size. They can get even just over five feet in length. This one probably isn't quite that length, um, but she's certainly respectable in size. And they are a pretty slender bodied snake, as you can see. Now I said this species of snake was called a red rat snake. You're probably looking at her and thinking, well, I'm not really seeing much red. I see lots of orange, but I'm not really seeing bright red. And that would be an excellent observation. This, the wild type of this snake, the kind you normally find in their native habitat does have more red. They have lots of kind of blotches, reds, browns, some darker orange, but not quite the bright orange that you're seeing in this individual. So this unusually colored corn snake is actually a color morph. So this is something that was bred for in captivity. Now corn snakes are really popular in the pet trade and they actually tend to breed really well in captivity. So what people often do is they kind of play with the genetics and they try to come up with different color morphs. A lot of people think these morphs are really beautiful uh, and some can be pre pretty valuable for breeders if they're trying to uh, make money by selling some of these reptiles. There are currently hundreds of different color morphs of corn snakes. Um, they come in all different colors now that people have bred for and tried to get new colors. Believe it or not, there's even a lavender corn snake, if you can believe that. Now this particular color morph is actually known as a creamsicle, which sounds like kind of a cute name, but I think it's a pretty appropriate name for this morph um, because she does kind of look like a creamsicle. Um, so that is why this snake is kind of that unusual color. And again, this wouldn't normally turn up in the wild. You might occasionally have an individual animal that's born with a genetic mutation and looks a little bit different, Chances are if a snake hatched and was this bright orange, um, it probably wouldn't do great surviving because pre predators would find uh, the snake and it probably wouldn't survive to adulthood. Um, but again, in captivity, people really like these interesting colors. Now I'm sure we already have a lot of questions. So why don't I turn it over to some of those? 
We do have a lot of questions. Um, to start off, I would like people to type in the Q&A if you can see the snake or not. So just say yes if you see it or no if you don't see it for me. And then we can maybe alter it. All right, looks like we can see that snake. So awesome. And we do have a lot of questions. So our Great. first question is one of our more popular one. Uh, Vivian, age nine, asked, what's her name? So this is kind of a lazy name. We actually just started calling her Creamsicle um, from a young age. That is technically her color more, um, but it is also her name. Again, we thought it was pretty cute sounding. So we just call her Creamsicle. Awesome. So our next question is how old is she? She is 10 years old. So she is mature. She is considered an adult. Um, they can live a pretty long time. They tend to live longer when they're living in captivity and people are taking care of them. So they are known to live 15, even 20 years in captivity. So hopefully she has many more years left. Awesome. Um, Lydia H4 wants to see the head of the snake a little bit more. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about the eyes. Yeah, let's talk about this animal's eyes, kind of the senses on that head. Um, so you'll notice her eyes are kind of red in appearance. Um, that would not be typical of a red rat snake in the wild. It is more associated with her color more. So she doesn't really have pigment in those eyes. I know she's, she's not staying very still right now and giving you guys a great chance to look at her eyes. Um, but they are pretty red because that actually means you're seeing the blood vessels in that eye. Uh, another thing about her head, you probably notice her sticking out her tongue a lot. This is helping her to smell. So every time she flicks out that tongue, she's picking up scent molecules and then pressing them to the roof of her mouth where she has a really special organ called a Jacobson's organ. This is telling her brain what she's smelling. So actually the space where we are in the museum right now, this snake has never been. So she's really picking up on lots of scents that are not familiar to her. So you'll see her doing a lot of that. Cool. Uh, a lot of people wanna know uh, what you feed her, but also what she may eat in the wild. Here at the museum, uh, she does eat a diet of mice. Uh, we do feed her mice that are already dead. Um, so we actually get them frozen and then thaw them out for her. Um, so she eats one dead mouse every week. So she eats once a week. In the wild, they would also eat a lot of rodents. So definitely mice, uh, maybe baby chipmunks, things like that if they can find them. Um, but they're not too picky. They are willing to eat uh, amphibians. So if they can find frogs and toads, they could find small lizards, um, eggs of other animals. Um, they're really not too picky. They are strict carnivores. So it's always going to be another animal that they're going to be eating. Well, cool. so Maddie would like to know, where is she from? So this particular individual um, did come from a reptile breeder. So like I said, a lot of breeders will uh, breed specifically for different color morphs. Um, we didn't get her specifically because she was a creamsicle. We were just looking to add a couple corn snakes to our collection. Uh, so she is from a breeder. Vivian, age nine, wants to know who eats it? That's a good question. Snakes are definitely more vulnerable when they're really tiny. When corn snakes first hatch, they're only about seven or eight inches long. They're really, really tiny. So pretty much anything is going to eat that. Birds, uh, predatory mammals uh, that might be around, things like bobcats, foxes would definitely go after them. Um, so they're gonna have a lot of predators when they're that tiny. Once they get pretty good size like this, uh, there might be some bigger mammals or bigger birds of prey that would go after them, but the predators are definitely fewer uh, when they are full size like this one. Great. Uh, Zachary would like to know if she can swim. So they're not known to spend a lot of time in the water. If they came across a shallow stream, I think they certainly would be able to get through it. Um, but they're not known water snakes. They don't tend to spend a ton of time in the water, but they certainly could get through something shallow if they came upon it. Lila, age nine, wants to know if she bites and someone else wants to know if she's poisonous. 
All right, both good questions. So we always say working with animals, anything with a mouth can bite. Um, snakes don't just bite for no reason. Um, so a lot of times in the wild, if a snake is approached, it feels scared, it's first gonna try to get away. If it feels cornered and threatened, it definitely might bite. Pretty much any animal that gets cornered like that is going to bite. It's not just snakes. They do kind of have that bad reputation for biting though. So this snake that Megan is holding has been with us for 10 years. She's very used to being handled. Um, so if at any point she felt afraid, she certainly could bite, um, but it's not very likely that she would because she's pretty friendly and she's pretty used to being around people. Now there is no venom behind that bite. This is a non-venomous snake. Megan is a really good sport helping me out today and she's really brave, but I don't think she'd hold a venomous snake in her bare hands. They are actually constrictors. So just like you may have heard boas, pythons, anacondas, those are all examples of constrictors. So they do squeeze their prey in order to kill and have no venom. Terry, age eight, would like to know how you tell a male from a female. It's really difficult from the outside of their body. Um, these kinds of snakes have nothing on the outsides of their body that tell the difference between males and females. Um, you do have to go inside the animal to figure out um, if it is a male or female. Um, now this one we do know is a female. So I have been referring to her as a female. Um, she actually did have babies. Uh, so she did reproduce here at the museum and she does have a male companion. That's really the only way we found out here at the museum is when she started laying eggs. Very interesting. And to go with that, Israel, age 11, wants to know in the wild, does a mother stay with them or abandon the eggs? They actually do abandon the eggs. Um, they pretty much lay them and then they kind of take off. And uh, the young, once they hatch, are pretty much on their own uh, to try to survive and make it to adulthood. Um, so they do leave the eggs uh, in the wild. I know it's hard for us to think of it like that, um, but that's just the way a lot of snakes work. All right, and for our last question on the snake, uh, Nirla, age 10, wants to know what color are they when they're first hatched or if they change colors? So sometimes the shading will change. A lot of times when snakes first hatch, they're really bright and vibrant. And sometimes that coloration will uh, fade a little bit, um, but they don't completely change color. Um, there are some kinds of snakes that do change color from juvenile to adult. Um, corn snakes are not one of those. Um, so this animal, since we've actually had her since she was a baby, she pretty much looked exactly like this. The colors might have been a little brighter when she was a baby, but she pretty much looked like this. Great. Okay. So I'm about to put up some facts about the corn snake and while we get ready for our next animal. So here are uh, some facts that you can take a picture of, a screenshot of, um, whatever works best for you. So here you can see the name, location, food, lifespan, and cool facts. Um, for those of you who can't see our snake separately, it may help to download the Zoom app and make sure that you are not in speaker view. Um, if you are on a computer, you can switch that from speaker view to uh, panelist style. And hopefully you can see both our educator and our animal at the same time. All right, so let me know when we're ready with our next animal. I think we are just about ready. I'll give you a bit of a kind of a teaser about this animal. It is a very common New England animal, but again, it's probably in a color you're not used to seeing. So Megan's gonna pull this animal up on our camera in just a moment. All right, worth the wait. So this animal, moving very quickly in her little display box that she is in, is an Eastern gray squirrel. Now this is the common squirrel that you see all the time outside. Now here in New England, we actually have a couple different tree squirrels. Gray squirrels are one example. We also have red squirrels and a couple species of flying squirrels. So those are the tree squirrels that we have in the area. 
We also have some ground squirrels. Believe it or not, chipmunks are a ground squirrel. And another ground squirrel is the woodchuck, also known as a groundhog. So overall, there are about 200 different species of squirrels. Now, I've been calling this an Eastern gray squirrel. You guys are probably looking at her and thinking, what is she talking about? That is a white squirrel. Now the species is an Eastern gray squirrel, but if you remember our theme for today, it is unusual colors. So gray squirrels don't normally come in white, um, but this particular individual is white. It is actually due to a genetic mutation. So you guys get to say that you met, met a pretty adorable uh, mutant uh, from the Museum of Science today. Now, a lot of times when people see a white animal, they think it is an albino. And there are certainly albino animals. If something is an albino or has albinism, it lacks pigment. So pigment is what gives our hair its color, our eyes the color. Uh, if an animal is albino, it is lacking pigment. I know I mentioned this earlier, but albino animals you typically can tell because they'll be all white and have those red eyes because again, you're seeing no pigment, you're seeing the blood vessels in the eyes. I know our squirrel is moving very quickly in her case, but if you get a glimpse at her eyes, you will see they are dark. So she does have some pigment. Her mutation is a little bit different. It is called leucism, or she is a leucistic gray squirrel. Uh, so again, she has some pigment, but it's very reduced. So she has those dark eyes. She has a couple dark flecks of fur in her tail. She also has some kind of reddish brown fur around her eyes. We often say she looks like a toasted marshmallow. Um, so that is that leucism, that very reduced pigment. Now, a lot of times people wonder how we have an Eastern gray squirrel here at the museum. So I do like to share her story. This particular squirrel was actually orphaned just about nine years ago during Hurricane Irene. So she was found as a young four week old baby, was way too young to take care of herself. So we actually hand raised her here at the museum. So she's what we refer to as imprinted. That kind of means she thinks she's a person in a little squirrel suit. She's very fixated on humans as being like her. Um, so she wouldn't really know how to go about taking care of herself in the wild. So now she has a nice important job here at the museum as an ambassador animal and gets to teach people. Now I know the squirrel often brings up lots of questions. So why don't I turn over to some of those, Sarah? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so our first question from Vivian and Ella, both age nine, wants to know what its name is. <laughs> Her name is Storm. Since she was found as a baby during a hurricane, uh, we thought that was a pretty good name for her. Uh, Peter, age 11, and uh, Vivian, age nine, wants to know what the squirrel eats. So she actually, I think she's found most of the food that I had hidden in that display case that she's in, which is why I think now she's kind of running around. Um, what she eats here at the museum is a special seed mix she eats a couple pieces of dry food that are specially made for rodents kept in captivity. Um, also fruits and vegetables. Uh, banana is one of her favorites. She does sometimes get things like nuts and uh, Cheerios are actually one of her favorite treats. Um, so she does eat lots of different things. Um, in the wild, they're gonna eat similar things, nuts, acorns, seeds, uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, I've heard of people seeing gray squirrels eat bagels pizza. They're really pretty opportunistic and will eat pretty much anything. Some of them are even known to eat insects occasionally or eggs of other animals. Um, so they are pretty, again, opportunistic and will find things to eat. Great. Uh, Janelle, Lila, and Ella want to all know how old is she? She is just about nine years old. People are often surprised by that because they had no idea gray squirrels could live that long. A lot of times when you see them in the wild, you might think they're kind of silly. Maybe you see them trying to dodge cars in the street, see them hiding nuts in your yard, um, but they are pretty long lived uh, in terms of rodents. Um, so nine years is definitely not unheard of in captivity. 
They've even been known to go upwards of 20 years in captivity. Uh, so that's in captivity. In the wild, they tend to not live quite as long. Um, it's pretty hard to survive to adulthood when you are a baby squirrel. Lots of different things will want to eat a baby squirrel. Uh, even this particular squirrel was, um, was orphaned as a young baby. So it is hard to make it through that first year as a squirrel. Uh, but once they make it to the, that year, an average in the wild is about five to seven years. So still a pretty respectable lifespan, but definitely longer in captivity. Bella, age 11, wants to know, are there other mutations that can happen? For example, getting blue eyes? I've never heard of a blue eyed mutation, um, but that doesn't mean something like that can't exist. I've just never heard of that. But that's actually a really good question because remember we talked about leucism as being too, too little pigment. Uh, there actually is the opposite mutation, which is too much pigment. Now that is known as melanism or a melanistic squirrel. And like this one is completely white. You probably can guess what a melanistic gray squirrel looks like. It is completely black. Uh, so pretty cool uh, to see uh, a melanistic squirrel too. Although I'm pretty partial to our leucistic gray squirrel. And I think there's probably some other ones uh, that turn up, but uh, those are the two that I know are the best known uh, for Eastern gray squirrels. Great. Um, can other animals, including humans, get leucism? Um, yes, other animals can get leucism or can be born with that uh, genetic mutation. I'm actually not positive if it turns up in humans. That's something I'd have to look into. Um, I certainly know that albinism uh, can turn up in humans. Um, so that's a, that's a good question. I might have to do a little more research myself. Uh, Maddie would like to know, are they considered a prey or a predator in the food chain? So they are definitely uh, considered prey. Um, even though they might occasionally eat things like insects, um, it's not that common. They tend to eat mostly vegetation. So they are definitely a prey animal. Lots of different things prey on Eastern gray squirrels. Uh, to give you some examples, birds of prey, hawks, owls would definitely go after them. When they're babies, even good sized snakes might go after them. Uh, bigger mammals, foxes, bobcats definitely would go after gray squirrels as well. So they are definitely a prey species. Olivia would like to know, how can she run so fast? <laughs> she is very fast. She was sitting very nice and calm during the first part of this presentation. And now I guess she just wants to make Megan work really hard and try to keep uh, the camera on her. Um, but Eastern gray squirrels are very good at climbing. Um, they are good at moving pretty quickly. Um, they're actually one of the only mammals that can climb down a tree head first. Um, so they are pretty impressive. And I would agree, they are pretty fast moving. Poppy, age seven, would like to know if she's fuzzy. She is very fuzzy. Um, since I hand raised her, she actually does still let me pick her up. Um, she wouldn't let me hold her for a 30 minute presentation. She wouldn't enjoy that very much. So that's why she's uh, kind of hanging out in that display box right now. Um, but she is pretty fuzzy. I'd probably say it's a little, a little rougher than like a cat's fur, um, but probably pretty similar to that. Vivian, age nine, wants to know if you have taken care of other squirrels before. Years ago, years before I raised this gray squirrel, I, I did do it once, um, but the baby that I hand raised actually was able to be released. Um, I was careful to not have it get too attached to me. Um, I guess I really liked this gray squirrel. So I uh, kind of wanted her to get attached to me um, so that we could keep her as an ambassador here at the museum. Um, but when I had done it before, we did release that squirrel. Watson, age 10, wants to know how you can tell the difference between a male and a female. There's actually no easy way uh, from the outside of their body. Um, they do have male and female parts, uh, so you can look at those to help you tell the difference, but there's no size difference, there's no color difference, so it's really not that easy to tell. Um, we do know this one is a female um, because, again, she does have female parts. 
Emmy would like to know if she has any other friends at the museum. So she does not have any other squirrel friends. Um, when we found her as a young baby, she actually did have a brother, um, but unfortunately he did not make it. Um, she was just a stronger animal um, and he did not make it. Um, so her friends at the museum really are her human friends. Um, she kind of thinks of me as her mother. So she's pretty bonded to me. Um, and she does react to people, um, even if she doesn't know them that well, she is still pretty interested in people. So those are more her friends here at the museum. Awesome. Well, I think that was our last question. Um, so thank you so much. We do have uh, some unanswered questions, but we're out of time today. So I'm gonna invite my presenters to wave goodbye and say goodbye to the squirrel. And while we do that, I'm going to share my screen of some more information about an Eastern gray squirrel. Uh, feel free to take a picture of this or a screenshot, whatever works best for you uh, to get some more information about Storm. So thank you all so much for being a part of this uh, live animal show today. Uh, I hope you have an amazing weekend. Happy Friday. And next Friday, we'll be having another live animal show. If you would like to check out more information about things that we're doing online and also in the museum, you can go to mos.org and also mos.org slash mos at home. If you enjoyed today's program and would like to support the museum, you can visit engage.mos.org slash welcome. So thank you all so much. Have an amazing weekend and I hope to see you next time.